Guys, this may be hard to believe, but we're live. <laughs> I know it's crazy, but it's true. I think we are. Yes, we are. Wow, that's great. Welcome, everybody. My name is Luke, and this is a an English class. For those of you watching this later, well, you missed it. I'm sorry. That's too bad. Maybe next time. If you are here live and you have questions, we'll be going through questions. I'll be answering questions as usual. Today is the 23rd, so Christmas is in two days. We might do a Christmas live stream. I'm thinking about it. If we could do a Christmas movie, that would be very cool. But the question is, how can I do that without <laughs> my channel being destroyed? I'm not sure. Well, anyway, welcome. And I'm glad you're here, if you are here. And if you're not, then you aren't seeing this, so I don't know who I'm talking to. We'll also be going through... Uh, a, a topic that I've been wanting to talk about for a while because it comes up and it's kind of an awkward topic, but I want to talk about it anyway because that can be interesting. If you haven't already, guys, I would appreciate it if you could hit the like button and subscribe as well. That way you can see when future live lessons happen, when future videos are posted, and so on. If you'll give me just a moment, I am going to update the cover, update the cover for uh, the class. I've got to do that. Now that's done. Now it's done. Now I've done it. Hip, hip, hooray. Okay. All set. I think we're all set. I think we're all set. I think we're all set. Let me just share this in the group as well. <laughs> Let me share this in the old, in the old WhatsApp group live all right and if there is a movie that you guys want to watch and we haven't yet you're welcome to recommend movies i'm more than happy to take on suggestions or ideas for movies we could watch the only requirement that i have is that it is in the public domain and that means excuse me that means that we can watch it legally <laughs> because we tried to do 12 angry men and that didn't go so well it was a kind of an issue and the video got taken down i thought it was in the public domain but it isn't apparently so that's kind of the requirement anyway i hope you guys have some good questions uh, i hope you uh, hope you don't mind hitting the like button or sharing or whatever you want to do and subscribing and the courses in the links in the description those are on sale at the moment so you can check those out when you have a second when you have some time all right a for anna's here hello anna and luba's here hey and arshad m arshad welcome welcome sir welcome welcome yeah see wouldn't it be so here's my gripe can i gripe Hello, Aleda. My gripe is, if I had some friends over to my house, let's say I invited you guys over to my house, we watched a Christmas movie together, like Home Alone, like Charlie Brown, or whatever, then that would be no problem, right? But because it's streaming on YouTube, it's a problem. And I don't know why there isn't a solution for this. I guess, uh, you know, because it because people may come to watch it and then not buy it or something like that. I mean, I guess I understand it from a business point of view. But also, it seems more like the type of thing where you would have your friends over to watch. So why can't I just virtually do that? I don't know. It's, I guess... I understand it, but I also feel a little frustrated by it. It's just one of those, one of those things. Yeah, so since Christmas is coming up in two days, what am I going to be doing? Not much, to be totally honest. I don't have any very big plans. I think I'll probably have a maybe a dinner at my house. Um, and maybe I'll, maybe I'll eat some Christmas cookies? I mean, that's about it. 
So I'm not going anywhere. I'm not going to my hometown or anything like that. I did that for Thanksgiving. It's a pretty long drive. I'm from Ohio. I live in New York. And it's a nine-hour drive from Ohio to New York, from New York to Ohio. So you can imagine doing that two times. You have to go both ways. So it's pretty intense. So in November, we did Thanksgiving. And so doing... Uh, doing Christmas as well one month later I just I can't deal with the drive so I'm just going to stay in New York and do do almost do almost nothing basically Eugene says I'll probably be cooped up all day nothing wrong with that you guys can watch Christmas movies by yourself drink some hot chocolate eat some cookies get fat that's what it's all about that's what the holidays are all about Hello from the Philippines. I don't know why I'm here. Merry Christmas. <laughs> At least you're honest, Jeff. I appreciate the honesty. I frankly don't know why I'm here either. If I'm being totally honest, who knows? Who knows exactly? It's hard to say. Well, so, so uh, does anybody have any questions? I do have a topic planned as usual, but does anybody have any questions around Christmas, traditions, English, Culture, pronunciation, grammar, idioms, whatever. If anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer those. This is, that's part of what we're doing today. Part of what we're doing is the Q&A part. So let me know if you wonder anything about anything. And I'll try to get to all the questions I sometimes do and sometimes don't. It depends on depends on how many questions there are and it depends on how much time how much time we have let's see ola from egypt is an interesting an interesting thing to say don't usually expect to hear an ola from egypt it's interesting i do have a video um top top christmas movies f six top christmas movies if you guys are looking for something to watch it may be worth checking that out. Um, maybe maybe I can show you that where that video is really quickly. If you're curious about it, if if you're curious about it, I can uh, I can show you that. Okay, hold on. Let me pop open YouTube. Find my own channel. Where's my own channel? Oh, it says Cloud English is live. That's not a surprise. That's true. That's just true. Christmas. Um, oh, yeah, here we go. So there is a uh, video on my channel, if you're curious, and it's the six best Christmas movies. I don't know who Mary's talking to. Let's let's check it out. Let's not. We're not going to watch the whole thing, but just if you're curious about, if you need a recommendation, right? If you need a recommendation, um, let me pop over here. Here we go. Here we go. Your skill requires custom breakpoints to okay. design responsive web experiences for any. This is an ad. Hey guys, my name is Luke, and in this video, we're going Luke. to talk about. Oh, the he does five, not look very no, healthy. Six Best yellow looking Christmas movies this one. Oh, Rudolph classic Ooh, Charlie Brown this Christmas classic Christmas so anyway if you need recommendations that would be the one to watch and uh, well why are all of my recommendations related to fractals that's interesting and if you want to watch two and a half hours of fractal animations then check out that video that is not has nothing to do with my channel <laughs> but i was watching that yesterday okay uh mary's here remember luba says i remember your story about teasing your brother with christmas cookies yes i used to feed my little brother poisoned christmas cookies as a way to torture him and that was a very good christmas memory What do you call the sweet bread that is eaten on Christmas, the one with nuts and dry fruits? That is called fruit cake. I think personally it's not very good, 
but um, it's a kind of somehow it became this sort of classic holiday food for whatever reason you buy people a Christmas fruit cake. It, I think it's becoming less of a tradition, but it used to be a very serious tradition. Oh, you would get a fruit cake, uh, and it would be one of those things that you only eat on Christmas. You eat, you would eat, um, you would have not eat eggnog, which is a a drink with eggs in it and fruit cake, uh, and this is something that you would only have around the holiday season for whatever reason. But it's not like delicious fruit in fruit cake. The reason I think fruit cake is kind of gross is that uh, let me see if I can show you what fruit cake looks like. So the reason I think fruit cake is kind of gross. This is fruit cake here. You can see F fruit cake is that this fruit is kind of it's like dried fruit and it's got a strange taste. It's not like fresh fruit. It's kind of gross, to be totally honest with you. And then the other one is the other only at Christmas thing is uh, eggnog. Let me show you a picture of eggnog. Some people like it. I, I, kind, I kind of like it, but I can only drink it once during the holiday season, and that's it. Just one time is fine. It's very thick. It's almost like a pudding. Sometimes it's alcoholic. Sometimes it's not. And I'm not exactly sure all of the ingredients or how it's made, but um, here's some eggnog. Okay, Holiday eggnog. And yes, it does have it does have egg in it. So, some people like it. Me, uh, I think it's okay. It's gift time. Yes, you also do Christmas gifts. I got a Christmas gift uh, from my mother yesterday. Uh, we got uh, we got some. We got lots of chocolate. Some homemade cookies. Uh, I got a shirt with the moon on it because <laughs> I like the moon. She knows that. I'm a big fan of the moon. So, yeah. Mary says, would you please talk about lucid dreams? Need your opinion on this context. Okay. Is this lucid dreams in the context, Mary, of lucid dreams in the context of English learning or just lucid dreams in general? So maybe we can just define what it is. Mary says, Luke, would you please talk about lucid dream? Need your opinion on this context. So if you don't know what it is, a lucid dream is a condition inside of a dream when you realize that you're dreaming. So, but you, but you didn't wake up. Most of the time when you are in a dream and you suddenly realize, oh, this is a dream, it's not real, you wake up, right? That's what happen most, happens most of the time. But sometimes, and I think most people have this experience, sometimes you realize it and you're able to stay inside, right? And there are different strategies and methods for lucid dreaming, and I think some of them work pretty well. I've managed to do it a couple of times, where, and it, but it's, it's very hard. It's getting close to waking up, and you feel like you're about to wake up, and then as soon as you realize that you've been dreaming, and you realize you're right at the border between dreaming and waking up, you make a choice, and you decide to do something. So instead of instead of allowing yourself to wake up, you, you change the dream maybe, but you immediately make a choice, and the choice in the dream kind of pulls you back into it. That's one method I've tried, but I've read a lot of different methods. I mean, obviously, the, the cool thing about it is that once you realize you're dreaming in your dream, you can do anything you want. You can start zapping things with electricity from your fingertips or flying around. You can do, you can do whatever. You're, you're basically now a superhuman, right? Um, it also makes me think, if, what if I'm going to someday realize that real life is somehow a lucid dream and what can I do to figure out that I'm that this is also a dream and go to the next sort of the next layer of of reality but anyway I guess that's a different question if you guys have other strategies on how to lucid dream or maybe how to how to select your dreams please share them 
One thing that I haven't been able to successfully do is choose which thing I'm going to dream before I go to bed. Some people say that they can decide what they're going to dream and then it happens. I don't think I I I've tried it many times, but I can't make it happen. But remembering dreams, I can often do. If you stay right at that border state as you're waking up, you you decide not to totally wake up and you just go back and revisit everything that just happened in the, in the dream. You're kind of rewriting it in your memory because it slips out of your memory very quickly. But you rewrite it by going back and reviewing everything. Then you can you can remember it more easily. I'm usually able to remember remember dreams, at least more often than I used to be. But that's just thinking as you're about to wake up. That's just saying, okay, what just happened? Uh, okay, I, I was over there, and then I went there, and then we did that, and then this happened. And that's actually very effective. I think that's very effective. Um, it's a very interesting topic. I think the dream topic is fascinating. I, lo I love talking about dreams and what they mean. Probably the most interesting material about dreams that I've been reading recently is is Carl Jung stuff. So if you're interested in what dreams mean and what they might mean and what they could mean, check out check out some Carl Jung, J U N G Jung. Well, thanks for the question, Mary. I appreciate it. Guys, if you haven't already, don't forget to don't forget to subscribe. You can check out also my full courses in the links in the description. And if also you haven't uh, and wouldn't mind, hit the like button to support support the channel and let people know that there is uh, a video here or a live stream. All right. That's a good question from Mary. Mary, do you do you um, lucid dream sometimes? Karina, hello, Merry Christmas. Gimeris33 says, you are, uh, you are the best teacher, Luke. I started on your course. Oh, thank you. Happy Holidays says, German Lopez. Thank you, German. Happy Holidays to you as well. Merry Christmas. Happy Hanukkah. What else do we got? Kwanzaa? Saturnalia? All of them. All of those. A for Anna is my student on Skillshare. Oh, that's great. Um, I came across Jordan Peterson's debate on YouTube, and then I dreamed about patriarchy. Yeah, wow, okay. That's interesting. Yeah, Jordan Peterson has some very interesting debates, for sure. For sure. But you didn't choose to have that dream. That dream kind of came out of your previous experience, right? Yeah, interesting stuff. That tradition, that bread is traditional in Colombia too. There is another uh, bread that is jam bread. It's it's from Venezuela and is really delicious. You know, Colombia has some very interesting bread for sure. Colombia, what's the one called? Is it is it pan de bono? Is that right? It's uh, basically a ball of bread which is very um, uh, buttery. And inside is cheese, so it's butter cheese bread, and I think it's I think it's I think it's pan de bono, unless I'm incorrect. But anyway, you eat it, and then afterward you go to the hospital because you you will have a heart attack. But it's delicious as well. It's delicious, but it causes uh, immediate heart attacks. Good stuff. I ate that last time I was in Colombia, probably three different times, and. Um, I had three different I had three separate heart attacks. Yeah, pandabono, I thought so. Because it's 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 very bono pan for sure. Hey, Jeet is here. Welcome, Jeet. Good to see you. Glad you're here. Well, maybe I can get to my topic for today and then and then I can answer any questions, any other questions that have come up. Um, okay, so my topic today is a little is a little weird, but it's just something I kind of want to respond to. So I hope you'll indulge me because it is a slightly it's not really English learning topic specifically. It's more like why and what's the difference. Okay. 
I get the question pretty often. Hey, Luke, you make videos on YouTube. You do live streams, but you also make courses and those are not free. So what's going on? Why in the world would anyone want to pay for something when they can just watch you on YouTube and check out your live streams? And it's a, it's a good question, right? So I thought I would just talk about this a little bit. I know it's kind of a, it's kind of an awkward thing, but I kind of want to just respond to this and answer answer that question because I think it's something that might be on a lot of people's minds. And there I think there is a good reason. So I kind of want to go over the reasons why or the the reasons why anyone, not even you, I'm not even saying, "Oh, you should you should go buy my courses." If you want to, you can. That's fine. But I want to talk about why someone would, and not necessarily only for my courses, right? But also anyone's courses. Why would anyone pay money to learn anything when you can find the stuff that you need, right, for free on Facebook or YouTube, and there are videos everywhere? Why? And I, I do. By the way, I am a, I am a paying learner of many services. I use Masterclass, I use Udemy, I'm on Skillshare, I'm a, I'm a paying student, and also I watch videos on YouTube. I do both. So I want to talk, talk about the reason, sort of free versus paid. Is there a difference? Is there any difference? And I think the answer is yes, otherwise I wouldn't, I wouldn't talk about it. But, but what are the differences? So let's explore that a little bit. I think the first and maybe the most important is focus. Right. So when when I make a, a video about something or when I'm talking about a, a specific a specific topic, right, I, I'm thinking about several things. I'm thinking about I want this video to be useful. Yes. But I also want this video to get a lot of views. And I also want to make sure this video isn't too long so that uh, people will click on it. And I also want to, you know, make, so I'm thinking about a hundred other things that don't have anything to do with learning. I'm thinking about that too, right? But they don't only have to do specifically with learning. And so when you're watching things on YouTube, just know that the motivation of that video is not only let me let me make something that's just going to help you. That is part of it, of course. But there are all these other things that are being considered. The title of the video, how to get clicks, all of that sort of <laughs> self-centered sort of thing. And that, that is also kind of true for courses. But the only purpose of a course is to provide valuable learning content. That's the purpose of a course. So it's incredibly focused on one goal, providing value to the learner. It's not about, ooh, how many people are going to click on this? Or, ooh, is it the right length? Do I have to add these little bits to get people to keep watching and trick them into keep watching or continue continuing watching? Well, you don't need to do that nearly as much in a course. It can be very focused on what you're trying to do, provide value to the learner. So that's one, and I think that's a, I think that's a pretty big one. But also structure. This may be even bigger, to be totally honest with you. It may be bigger. So when you, when you go on to YouTube, you find a video about this, you find a video about that, you find a video about this. It's very fragmented, different people presenting different things, talking about different topics. And that's great. I do that too. I, I do. But when you go to university and you take a course, why, why did you pay... $20,000 to go to university and take a course rather than learn that on YouTube. Some of you might say, well, you guess you don't have to. But there's something about the structure of the content and the way that it's presented. There is a method behind it that is not a short-term method, but is a long-term method, lesson after lesson, being in a specific structure following a specific order, presented in a specific way. Because these people are professionals, right? 
lecturers are professionals, professional, professors are professionals, professor, professor, I can't say that quickly. Professor, professors are professionals, professors are professionals. There is a method behind it that makes learning much more effective and efficient. So for example, when I'm building a course, rather than just thinking of a topic and talking about that, I'm spending months, months, two months on one course, writing it out, arranging things, making sure that the structure is perfect to maximize learning. And it's continuous rather than being fragmented a little bit here and there. It's all organized and packaged and neat in order. First you do this and then you do this. And if you do it in this order specifically, then it's going to have more impact. And that's what, that's what teachers who teach courses on Udemy or Skillshare or whatever, or university professors, that's what they're doing. Order is very important. Structure is very important. It's not about only the content. It's not about only what knowledge is there. It's about how it's, how it's presented, how it's packaged, and how it's organized. And I think that's pretty important as well. Now, how about quality? Well, of course, of course, quality can be there for free, right? People, I mean, hopefully, hopefully YouTube videos are high quality, yes. But there may be a difference between spending a week on a video and spending three months on a lesson or a series of lessons, right? So this is just speaking for myself now. Um, when I'm planning a YouTube video, I usually spend a day planning it, and then I spend a few hours filming it, and then maybe a few hours editing it. Because I, I want it to be good. I want it to be high quality, sound quality, video quality, structure, content, all good, hopefully. I hope. But when I'm working on a course, it's like a different level. It's a completely different level. I I one time I spent an entire year on one course, an entire year on one course. I spent three and a half months only on writing it, structure, making sure that that's there. I spent I spent another few months just on filming take after take, if I didn't get something perfect, if I didn't say it perfectly, go back, say it again, again and again and again. Hundreds of hours of video just to get down to 15 hours. Then editing it, making it flow perfectly so that the quality is at, at that high level. So for, for something that's, for something that people are for something that people are willing to spend their money on there is just this maybe need to not only make it good, but make it so good that when they watch it, they go, wow, this is, this is totally worth my money, 100%. I can see how much time this person spent, in, spent doing this. That course, I spent hundreds of hours sitting in front of a camera, and finally the course is 15 hours long. So, so hundreds of hours are cut out and don't even... I deleted it. It's gone. But in order to get down to that 15 hours, it had to be hundreds of hours. A lot of people do the same thing. So that's how, I mean, that's just a different level, I think, of quality. So that I think that matters. I think it makes a difference as well. Now, what about depth? I think this is the last, the last point. Depth is going into detail. The problem with, with uh, YouTube videos, usually, now this is just a trend in general, if you make a 50 minute video on a topic, fewer people want to watch a 50 minute video on a, on a topic than want to watch a an eight minute to 10 minute video on a topic on Facebook, on YouTube, actually, especially Facebook, right? There are people who do. I love watching 50 minute videos, but a lot of people prefer, give me it in a bite sized way, right? But that means you can't get the depth into that. You can't get 10 examples that you need to fully understand this idea. And so you're getting kind of a Diet Coke version of it, a lighter version of it, because the creator knows, like, if I give 10 examples, people are not going to watch this, or at least many people won't. But if you make a course, then it's about learning that thing. 
Then you can do one lesson to introduce it, the next lesson with example two, the next lesson with example three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Then when you get through all of those ten lessons, you you fully understand this thing. You've gone in depth. You understand it deeply, and you will never forget it. As opposed to getting kind of a taster, uh, often on 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 YouTube, for example. And again, there are there's great content out there, and you can get things that are in depth. But in general, a lot of people, especially when it comes to like English language learning, will favor creators will favor making a simpler, shorter video because they know that more people tend to click on simpler, shorter videos with less detail than something that's really in depth. So a lot of the in depth stuff I talk about, I leave that for the courses. I don't even mention that here. Uh, I don't mention that in my videos. I don't mention that in my live streams. I don't even really talk about it that much. The in depth stuff that's planned with examples and extremely complex, that stuff is in the courses. So that's just my sort of um, way of looking at the difference between these two things. I know it's pretty general and it's not true for everybody. You can find most of what you want for free, but consider those those other factors as well. And at least from my point of view, that's what it is. So if you haven't already, guys, make sure you hit the like button. If you have any questions, let me know. Hit subscribe as well. And <laughs> I've got to mention it. If you're interested in improving your, your English seriously and you do want to check out something like a crazy 15-hour course that I spent hundreds and hundreds of hours making, then check out the link in the description. I think it's the first course up there. You're welcome to check it out, but if you don't, that's totally fine with me. Okay. Yeah, I am I am a bit of a perfectionist. Although I'm learning to be less so on for example live streams and YouTube videos. I used to spend more too much time I think working on those and now I spend less. So I just kind of I'm a bit more relaxed about about that. But when it comes to the courses I'm kind of yeah, perfectionist. I spent one time I spent all day recording and only got like five five usable minutes. Crazy. Jeet says, if teachers teach everything for free, how would they earn their living? On the contrary, if learners learn all the things without paying, they might not value them. Yeah, that's a fair. I think that's right. That's right. Yeah, I mean, that is honestly how the main way I make my living, to be totally honest with you, is courses. Um, uh, I have something like 80,000 80, students who have taken my courses. So... Uh, that's that's how I that's what that's kind of my job at this point. That's what I do. It's how I make my living. It's how I survive. Is my courses. So yeah, if you guys in addition want to support the channel, then then check out the courses for sure. Um, GB Plus, hello Luke. Merry Christmas to you and all the viewers today. Wow, very generous. Booze is an alcoholic beverage, as far as I know. Booze is just another way to say alcohol. Yeah, that's right. Okay. What is tipple and booze? Tipple. I'm not sure what tipple is. Tipple. Hmm. Okay. Have I missed any questions? Tip. Oh, uh, maybe you mean tipsy. Tipsy is when you someone. So booze is is alcohol, but tipsy is when someone has had a little too much and they are a little drunk. I'm a bit tipsy. Not not totally drunk. There are many different words to describe drunkenness. Tipsy is kind of like a that state. That's tipsy. I'm a bit tipsy. Um. I guess the lightest one would be something like buzzed. Buzzed would be not not even tipsy, not not drunk at all, but you feel it. You've had a glass of red wine and you feel it, but you're fine. Everything is functioning properly. Tipsy is you're starting to... Yeah, yeah. And then drunk would be more than that. And then you would get into something like hammered or shit-faced or something like that. That would be that would be 
blackout almost blackout drunk when you you lose con complete control of yourself that would be a different level uh, let's see have I ever been blackout drunk no I don't think so I have been very drunk before maybe in my early 20s a couple times and it wasn't fun and the next day I felt very bad so I haven't been very very drunk in a long time but I, I used I, I have been in the past um, my 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 younger self um, but just a few times now now I'll have a drink sometimes in the evening a couple times a week I might have a glass of uh, whiskey which I like and I like I like gin so I might have a, a a small glass of gin in the evening that's nice sometimes a little red wine is good to have um, two or three times a week I might have a drink but uh, I, I don't find it to be a little more than that is unpleasant you know it's buzzed is a good word I think buzzed is okay Luke have you read this book unnatural causes written by P. D. James, Unnatural Causes. Let me search it. I haven't read it for sure. Uh, let me see. Unnatural Causes. P. D. James. What is it about? It's a detective no novel by English crime writer. The, 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 the. P.D. James. Um, no, I haven't. I'll be totally honest. I I don't I don't know if I've I've have I very rarely read detective novels, and uh, in fact, I very rarely read fiction at this point. I read almost no fiction, and maybe that's not a good thing. I don't know, but uh, I, I I just read so little fiction. I do have a plan this year to read the Dune series. The Dune series uh, is a science fiction series, and I'm I'm looking forward to reading that. I I wanna I wanna understand the universe of Dune, but otherwise, I mean, right now I'm reading. Let's see, what am I reading right at this moment? Let's see. I'm reading Denial of Death for a book club by Ernst Becker. I'm reading the Nicomachean Ethics by Aristotle. I'm I'm reading Groundwork of uh, the Metaphysics of Morals by Immanuel Kant. I'm reading. Oh, I just finished Civilization and Its Discontents by Sigmund Freud. I'm doing a course from the Great Courses called. Great Minds of the Eastern Intellectual Tradition. I'm reading The Critique of Practical Reason by Immanuel Kant. And that's it. That's all I'm reading. Too, maybe too many at the moment. I should probably finish some of those first. Those, but those are, those are the things I'm reading at the moment. Yeah. Mostly philosophy and psychology. Yeah, all at the same time. I know it's not maybe not so good. I read I often read maybe five or six books at one time. And uh I don't know why. I just like to move back and forth. What is at will? Is it true that usually you use it at the end of a sentence? Yes, that is right. Yes. It just means you can do it when you want to do it. But you could put it in the in in other parts of the sentence. It's just not as common. You could say, um, "I can vomit at will." <laughs> That'd be a weird example. Um, yeah. So let me quickly answer this. I guess more completely. A for Anna says, "What is at will? Is it true that usually you use it at the end of the sentence? What does it mean? At will means that you can do it." when you want to do it. That's it. Exactly when you want that to happen. Now, usually it's about things that 
you would have control over. For example, you couldn't say that you can you can cause a tornado in Nebraska, right? Because well, unless you're a super a superhero, then that's kind of ridiculous. But <clears throat> excuse me. If <clears throat> if you're describing a superhero, then you would say that they can do that. They can do that at will. And you're right. Excuse me. Sorry, I got a cough. <coughs> and you're you're right to say that they would do that. <clears throat> Sorry, guys, my throat. You would be right to say that they would do that at will if that was their superpower, like Storm from the X-Men. She can cause a tornado at will. She can cause a tornado at will. Now, could you say, at will, she can cause a tornado? It's grammatically correct. Yes, you could put that at the beginning of the sentence with a comma after it. It's a prepositional phrase, comma after it, and say, at will, she can cause a tornado. That is not as common, not nearly as common as putting it at the end. But we don't usually talk about superheroes, so we talk about ourselves. So what can you do at will? Well, probably a lot of things, but you wouldn't mention it unless it were somehow different or not, not normal uh, compared to what other people can do. For example, right, I knew someone in high school. It's a very weird thing. I knew someone in high school who could throw up vomit at will. Now, most people I know can't just bleh, throw up whenever they want to. Why would you want to do that anyway? But this guy used to be able to just immediately throw up. He would sit there, and then after two seconds, he would throw up. He could throw up at will. Now, why did he do that? I, he just thought it was funny, and people would gather around him and say, oh, do it, do it, do it, do it. High school, stupid, right? Very stupid. But that that's just a way to say that that's what he could do, and it's a way to focus on his ability as soon as he intends that to happen. So will is about your intention and what you want to happen. And you can will something that doesn't happen, but we describe something being done at will as when we want it to happen, it does happen. So he could do that and that's different. And that's why we would describe that as at will because it's unusual. You wouldn't say something like, I can blink at will. Yeah, of course you can blink at will, but why in the world would you mention that? Everyone blinks, can blink at will. It's not interesting. But if you can slow your heart rate down to 20 beats per minute at will, that's unusual. That's interesting. Then you might say it. Then you might use it. So it's usually to describe that kind of thing which is outside of the ordinary, which most people can't do. Then it makes sense, right? Like regurgitating a frog. Have you ever seen David Blaine? He puts a frog in his stomach and then he makes the frog come back up at will. It's very interesting. Kind of crazy to watch, but very interesting. It's a good question, Anna. Guys, if you haven't already, don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Also, like if you don't mind and check out my full courses in the links in the description. Luba says, I can uh, make my hand not feel pain as well. That's very interesting. So you can make your, your hand not feel pain at will, meaning when you decide. But does that mean that if you don't decide that, then your, pain, your, your hand does feel pain? Is that what that means? Hmm. Nihat says, I wish you and your family a very happy Merry Christmas. Okay, thank you very much. You can just say Merry Christmas because Merry means happy. But thank you. You can't keep your eyes open and sneeze at will. I've tried that. I can. I can. I can, I can uh, keep my eyes open and sneeze. I like, Mary says, I like the way she describes brutal death scenes. I think I'm weird at this point. Well, nothing wrong with weirdness. Ah, self-hypnosis. Very interesting. Self-hypnosis. Self-hypnosis is when you put yourself into a state 
of, uh, what would it be? An automatic state when the unconscious comes up and the conscious mind is pushed slightly down. And it's, it's, an, it's a known thing. And often it allows someone to, to tell you to do something and you do it. You think you're a chicken. You think you're a chicken. And you walk around and cluck like a chicken. That would be someone hypnotizing you. Hypnosis is a real thing. Often people will use hypnosis as a way to, as a way to um, get people to remember details that they don't consciously remember. You can access maybe uh, uh, all of your memories in hypnosis, or sometimes you can. Self-hypnosis means doing that to yourself, which I think is a very interesting thing. I wonder if I could self-hypnotize myself to, um, what would I want to, to learn how to do? I want to be able to self-hypnotize myself so that I can remember every single word of every book that I've ever read. That's what I want. I want to be able to remember every word. Nihat says, watch your throat, dude. Okay, will do. Um, did I miss any questions? I don't think so. Could you please... Jeet, are you asking me pr to pronounce a non-English word? Could you please pronounce... What is that? I don't even know what that is. It's hard for me to pronounce a word that... I don't think that's English, is it? What is this? What is this? So, Hiawatha, also known as Ayanwata, or Ayanwata is a <clears throat> pre-colonial First Nations. I'm going to mute and cough. That way it's not disturbing to anybody. I don't know what's up with my, <clears throat> what's up with my throat. It's very, very, it's not comfortable. It's uncomfortable. Uh, nation leader or co-founder. Of the Iroquois Confederacy. He was a leader of the On Onondaga people, uh, the Mohawk people. Yeah. Um, I, I, I don't know. Maybe Hiawatha is just my guess. I have no idea. I mean, I don't uh, know Native American pronunciations. No idea. Hiawatha sounds about right looks right to me but don't take my word for it lisa says did you finish zarathustra yes i did i did i finished thus spoke zarathustra it's a very interesting book so if you want to get a sort of intense version of nietzsche that is, in some places, interesting. In some places, I think a little too intense. Zarathustra would be would be good because I think it covers most of his philosophy through the lens of someone who has kind of little patience with society, and is, he's at a point where he doesn't care. What other people think he's an he's an enlightened being basically and well he cares but he doesn't care so it's from this vantage point so you get to sort of follow along the um the journey of this person who's getting close to the highest level that a human could reach basically what nietzsche calls the overman and there are times when he gets tired of what he calls the rabble, common people, and comes back to his cave, and then he goes out almost to re-energize himself. But it's all about the idea of, well, Christianity would be one, but modern culture, especially Western culture, being this fossil, which is no longer useful or nourishing to human beings and that humanity has to go beyond itself to transcend itself and that there aren't any of those people 
Zarathustra wasn't even one of those. He was sort of like the person who's coming before that person. And Nietzsche describes that person as someone called the Ubermensch or the Overman or the Superman who will not take part in any of the culture that has come before, who will invent as an act of will, creative will, his own culture and take humanity to a new level, no longer human, called the Overman. Very interesting stuff. Very interesting philosophy. I mean, that's a pretty broad, broad stroke. It's a lot more, it's a lot, there's a lot more to it. But if you're interested in philosophy and you haven't checked out that particular book, Thus Spoke Zarathustra, it's worth a read. It's absolutely worth a read. Again, I find it sometimes very tiring because he's often just uh, frustrated with something and and just goes on a rant about about one topic and it gets a little tiring and I kind of want to break <laughs> once in a while. But it's still really interesting and worth reading. So, yeah, if you feel like you're at that level and you want to challenge yourself, you're interested in philosophy, check out Thus Spoke Zarathustra. If you find it difficult, don't beat yourself up about it. It's a tough book to read. Guys, if you haven't already, make sure you hit the subscribe button. Don't forget to hit like as well and check out my full courses in the links in the description. <clears throat> Mary says, I recommend or I remember you recommended once Schitt's Creek. What was the main thing that you liked about it? Uh, I like Schitt's Creek because it's pretty well balanced. I mean, for language learners, I think it's pretty well balanced. You can get a good sense of the culture because you have people, these rich people who were rich and are now poor who come to this small town and you can see sort of, you can get a sense for the American social dynamics between kind of lower class people and wealthy people. And also you can see how real people talk. You can see generational differences. And so you get a sort of big picture, I think, pretty good big picture of, of, of the culture overall. And the language is pretty straightforward. I don't think it's too difficult. It's funny. I think the characters are very funny. And um, um, I, yeah, it's, it's, it's entertaining. Does it have a single story? No, it doesn't. Not really. Each character has their own, their own story. A for Anna recommends that I drink a lot of plain water and gargle with salt water. Take care of yourself. Will do. Will do. Yeah, sometimes I just kind of my scratchy throat. Oh, is Zarathustra uh, is has different chapters. Yeah, but it is it does feel like one big piece, honestly. A small wind-beaten face. I guess that would be maybe a red face that um, someone who lives in a place where people are outside a lot and uh, they have a red face because of the wind. I guess that, that's what that would be. Is it cold in New York? Yeah, it's very cold in New York. It's very cold, it's snowy, it's the slush, it's uh, it's all bad. Cloudy, it's not nice outside. <laughs> Zarathustra, I think, belongs to Iran. Uh, the, the Zoroastrians are actually not, as far as I know, not in Iran. I think the modern Zoroastrians are in India near, uh, near Mumbai, I believe. There may be Zoroastrians in Iran, too, as far as I know. I mean, there are only a few hundred thousand Zoroastrians. Um, but there's a difference between Zarathustra in Thus Spoke Zarathustra and the Zoroaster or Zarathustra of history. Although Nietzsche chose Zoroaster for a specific reason, Zarathustra for a specific reason. It's just not the same person. He used a lot of creative license. He's nothing like the real 
uh, Zoroaster, really. He didn't actually follow the principle. Zoroastrians, uh, they believe, they, they're, they're, it's a dualistic religion, which means they believe in two worlds. There's the, there's the physical and there's the, um, the, the spiritual, and they uh, believe there's good and there's evil, and things should be labeled as good or evil. And the, um, the good would be represented by the chief god in Zoroastrianism, which is, his name is Ahura Mazda. And the evil would be represented as, I think it's pronounced Angramenu, which is the, the sort of evil deity. And they represent good and bad and these two very clear sides. And, and I think the main focus of Zoroastrian t today, Zoroastrianism today is around India, around Mumbai, that area. And they have uh, temples where they do fire rituals. So fire is a big part of it where um, you, fire is a source of purity because you can burn away, you can burn away the Im impurity of things. And they used to, so they used to use that for their to burn their dead bodies when someone died. But I guess now they can't do that anymore, so they're using different ways. But fire is still a very big part of the religion, as far as I know. Um, yeah, I'm interested in, in Zoroastrianism, for sure. Rias says, hi, how are you? I'm doing very well, Rias. How are you doing? Okay, um, if there are no other questions, well, then then where can we go? Oh, actually, I missed this question. An actual question about Christmas. I love Christmas questions. A for Anna says, how's your Christmas preparations? Do you have any Christmas tree and what's your present for yourself? So it's a good question. Today's the 23rd, and it's it's kind of strange. So I feel more and more as I get older that Christmas is for kids. <laughs> when I was a little kid, Christmas was the most exciting thing in the world. The night before Christmas is the best feeling ever. Christmas cookies and Christmas music, all of that stuff. Nothing better than that. Nothing more exciting. A feeling of warmth and joy. Now, to be totally honest with you, I feel nothing. <laughs> I'm busy. I've got stuff to do. I'm an adult. I'm 32 years old. I don't care. Because I think I'm in this middle period where I don't have children yet. And I'm not a child. So I'm in a period where it, it, it's not relevant to me. But I would imagine if I had a couple of kids or something then it would suddenly become magical again because I want to provide a magical experience for children, for my children because I remember what it was like to experience the magic of Christmas, right? So I think for parents, Christmas has that magic again in a different way. You provide it to your kids. So what am I doing this year? I, I, I'm having a probably a dinner at my house. Not a big deal. Chinese hot pot, I think, is what I'm doing. Um, but not a big thing, not big at all. I have one Christmas decoration, which is a Christmas tree that I bought from the supermarket. I went to the supermarket and I got a real tree, that tree. I said, give me that tree. They brought it to my house. They put it in my house. I put some lights on it, but not when I was a kid, we would look at every decoration, put it carefully on the tree, this whole magical process. I just put the put the tree in my house and, and I just throw some lights on it. All right, let's go. Right. No, no feeling of ceremony or no feeling of tradition, no Christmas music, no Christmas cookies, nothing like that. So it's kind of sad. And very sadly, usually a Christmas tree will last into January, maybe middle of January. That's when you need to throw it away. If it's a real tree, my tree is a real tree. But for some reason, this tree that I got has turned brown very quickly. It's starting to turn brown already. So I'm actually planning to throw it away today or tomorrow, which is before Christmas, which means I bought a Christmas tree for Christmas 
and I'll be throwing it away before Christmas. Which is crazy if you think about it. I, I will have no Christmas tree for Christmas, but I did have a Christmas tree before Christmas. Very sad. Anyway, that's what it's like this year. And uh, I hope that's not too disappointing. Guys, if you haven't already, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe. Check out my full courses, of course, of course, in the links in the description. And hit the like button. I'd appreciate it. Raketa says, my husband is 32, and he says the same. Mm, okay. Uh, Christmas is not relevant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Christmas is nothing to me. Everyone says the same thing. <laughs> Christmas is nothing. I think, I really do think it's only magical when you are a kid or you have kids. And I think that's about it, to be honest. <laughs> a good question i like that one german's got a good question mary mccain says it was wednesday today that's true and i thought we were going to watch a movie but that was a great session as usual recommend big mama's house how can we watch big mama's house i'd love to it's my dream to watch a movie like that but we can't we'll get we'll get the channel will be shut down forever and we may do a christmas movie tomorrow or thursday maybe I'm going to try to do that, but I'm looking. The problem, the reason we're not watching a movie today is because I looked and I looked and I looked and I looked and I can't find a Christmas movie that we can actually watch on YouTube together. It's very hard to find good public domain movies. So if you have one and you, if, 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 if we can watch one, we will. Believe me, I want to, uh, Mary. It's my, it's my dream to watch a good Christmas movie together, but it's tough. Luba says that's very sad. I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's what it is. So German says, when to use dotting I's and crossing T's. Well, we usually say dot your I's and cross your T's. Be sure to dot your I's and cross your T's. We usually use this, not only for legal things, but we usually use this when we want to say, make sure it's really done and don't just say, I'm ah, good enough and let it go because that could come back to bite you, which is another interesting phrase. If something comes back to bite you, it means you made a mistake or you do something wrong. And then because of that, because you weren't careful enough or thoughtful enough, this thing has returned and caused damage to you, okay? So let's think of it from a legal point of view. Let's say you had a, a, an oral contract with someone, or maybe it's just a chat. You had a chat conversation, and you made an agreement with someone about what you're going to do. And then three months later, something comes up, and you say, hey, what about that thing we agreed to? The other person says, what thing? I don't know what you're talking about. And you say, hey, look at this. You said it in a group chat. See? And they say, I didn't sign anything. Sorry, I, I, I don't know what you're talking about. Legally, they're right, probably. Because it's not a binding agreement unless there's a signature on it on a piece of paper. So there, specifically, when we say, well, I should have, I should have dotted my I's and crossed my T's, or crossed my T's and dotted my I's, and usually it starts with the T's, what it means is you should... You should complete the things that you're going to do to avoid those future things, to avoid that kind of regret. And I use that signature example as a, as a simple way to explain it, but it can be used for a lot of other things as well. Any time, any time, you could be careful and you decide to be less careful. You could think ahead and think about what could go wrong and you decide not to do that. Any time you don't do that and then you're at risk of of causing a mess for yourself later, you're not crossing your T's and dotting your I's. And it is, I think, in reference to a contract, right? Because you make the stick of the T and the stick of the I, but you don't go back and right and do that part. So it's kind of saying, you know, be careful, pay attention. To, if you're going to sign something, read it, 
If you're going to make an agreement, make sure it's really an agreement. If you're going to uh, sign up for a service, make sure you understand what you're getting into. If you're going to make a financial plan, make sure that you're thorough and careful. Whatever it is, right? That That's generally what we mean by crossing your T's and dot dotting your I's. To be careful, to be thorough, and to think ahead. I hope that answer your, answers your question. German, if you guys have any others, let me know. And also, don't forget to hit the like button, subscribe, and check out my full courses in the links in the description. Okay. Um, Catalina says, who do you live with? I live with a lady who is my wife uh, and um, she's from China and I live with two cats so I live with two cats one is called a circle and the other is called a doorbell and a wife one wife two cats and myself and this dinosaur this dinosaur which I keep on my desk Min says, da, 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 don't come between 5 and 6 as the roads will be really busy. Everyone will be going home. What does will be going? I'm a cat person. That's right. I respect cats' emotional independence. Don't come between. Um, okay. Answer Min's question here. Min says, Hi Luke, today I read this sentence on the grammar book. Don't come between 5 and 6 as the roads will be really busy. Everyone will be going home. What does will be going mean? So if you say will be going, then that will be is the future part and the going part is actually physically moving. So actually this meaning is very simple. The will be going means in the future, the thing that I will do is go. <laughs> That's what it means. So the go part here is about the movement. So they're outside, they're at the shopping centers, they're at the mall, they're visiting people, and they're returning home. They're returning from wherever they were. And so as a result, between 5 and 6 p.m., probably, the roads are going to be very busy. Probably people are at work, right? We call that rush hour, by the way. So this means... If you come now, if you come between 5 and 6, at this time, eh, that window of time is probably not good because you're going to hit rush hour. If you hit rush hour, then it's going to be gridlock traffic. It's going to be very bad traffic. And the cars are going to be moving very slowly. Traffic jams. Terrible. Okay. Because it's rush hour. Why? Because everyone was at work and now they're driving home between five and six. Okay. We say we'll be going because it's happening later. It's not five or six now. It is maybe 2 p.m. or it's the day before or whatever. We'll be going home in the future. That's what will happen. Now, this might be a, con a point of confusion because we often say things like, I'm going, I'm going to go home. I'm going to go home. So which go is about the, the movement and which go is about the future? Hey, so this, this one is different. If I say I'm going to go home, then the I'm going part is no longer about the movement from here to there. 
If you hear someone say, I'm, I'm going to something, then the I'm going to part means that's the future thing. So that's kind of equivalent to will. It's like will, right? And then after to, that verb is about the action that will be in the future. I'm going to sleep. I'm going to do my homework. I'm going to I'm going to buy some headphones. Now, that can have different meanings too because someone could say I'm going to buy some headphones now. That means I'm leaving here right now to do that. Okay. So that means that at this moment here I go. And now the going is about the movement and buy. Buy is the action that that will happen when I get there. So it's sort of continuing. It's happening at the moment. It's progressive. But if I say I'm going to buy headphones tomorrow, then I'm not doing anything now. And that going to is more like will. So you have to pay attention to the context. I'm going to sleep. Okay, this going right now, it's continuous tense. Here I go. And I'm going over here. And now I'm going over here. This is about my movement. But if I say I'm going to sleep in a couple hours after the movie. Okay, so this I'm going to sleep is not what I'm doing right now. It's not about my movement now. This I'm going is equivalent to I will. It's like saying I'm going to sleep in a few hours is like saying I will go to sleep in a few hours. Okay, so you just have to pay attention to the context. This going can cause confusion as a result of that because it can mean movement now, continuous in the moment, continuous tense. It can mean the future as in will, and it can be just a description of what will happen after, after we say, for example, this one will be going, will be going. This one is also in the future, but is using, using the ing form. So it can get confusing, but I hope that makes it a little simpler. I hope that answers your question. If it doesn't, then let me know in the comments. Guys, if you haven't already, don't forget to hit the like button. Of course, subscribe. That would help out a lot. And check out my full courses in the links in the description. Ovi Islam asks questions with one, two, three, four, five question marks. Should I watch movies with subtitles or not? The answer is no. <sighs> uh, Marcella? Uh, uh, How do I say your name, Marcella? That's a tough one. Ah, I wish I could pronounce names perfectly right away. Araujo. Araujo. Hello from Brazil. Hello. Sadie's hopes were dipping. What is dipping in this context? It's like this. Going down. So it's on the way down. Decreasing. Expectations. What you think might happen is going down. Negative. Yeah. My hopes are beginning to dip. Ooh, that's not good. That's not good. All right. Well, we have some good questions. Some good questions. Uh, I'm going to keep looking for a Christmas movie we can watch. If I find one, if I find any Christmas-related movie that we can legally watch together on YouTube... I will, we will watch it either tomorrow or the next day. I promise that. But I'm not sure if I can because I looked today and yesterday and I could not find one. And if anyone has any knowledge of a movie we could watch together, that would be awesome. I want it to be a, a holiday movie or a Christmas movie of some kind. That would be great. Uh, it would be so cool, I think, to do that together. But um, so far, no luck. So I'll keep looking. And in the meantime, if you guys have any, let me know. Please, please, please. Well, I think we'll, I think we'll call it a day. So thanks for all the great questions. Thanks for joining. 
Thanks for listening. Thanks for everything. And I hope you all have a wonderful holiday season. If you celebrate Christmas, well then, Merry Christmas to you. If you don't, then Merry, Happy, whatever to you. Whatever you prefer. That's fine. I'm going to go have some lunch, I think, and then I'm going to get back to work on my courses. I'm in the middle of filming, and it is very intense filming the course on writing fundamentals, the fundamentals of writing well, which I'm realizing, actually, could be could be uh, useful for even English native English speakers, I think. Um, surprising how how poor even a lot of native English speakers write. It's, it's shocking. I've learned in the last maybe two years, wow, a lot of native English speakers actually write very badly. So it's a fun it's a fun course to uh, to do to work on. Hey, thanks, Lopez. Thank you, Luba. The Ross's Room movie, it's on YouTube. R-O-S's, okay, I'm going to search this. Mary, Mary's, Mary's giving me ideas. R-O-S, Room movie. All right, I'll search it. Thank you. Ah, Nightmare Before Christmas, no way. I wish we could watch that one together. Thank you for us. I'm actually struggling to pronounce this word's veterinarian and interchangeably. So let me say those and then and then we're done. So people say it differently. One some people say it as veterinarian. 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 Yeah, five syllables. Some people say veterinarian, which is six. Veterinarian. Veterinarian. Six syllables. So vetcher or veterinarian. Then the other one is interchangeably 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 five syllables all right see you guys bye bye take care